A hundred years ago, the world was very hopeful that the slaughter of World War I would come to an end. And indeed, a few months later, in November, there was the armistice, the end of World War I. However, the bad news nobody had anticipated, including those who had survived in the trenches and so on, was that the largest epidemic of modern times would hit the world, the so-called Spanish flu. The Spanish flu, which killed more people than the whole of World War I. And interestingly, whereas World War I is in our collective memory, my grandfather um, took us every year to um, the trenches, to the poppy fields in Flanders, where he had spent three, four years. I'm from Flanders, Belgium. But the Spanish flu is not remembered uh, collectively, not as a historic disaster. And that's a quote from Laura Spinney, um, a book I can highly recommend, and that's um, called Pale Rider, about the Spanish flu and how it changed the world. And when you look at it, just here are some um, fairly basic uh, statistics. You can see that um, there was a huge peak in mortality coming in actually three waves around starting in March uh, 1918 and then a second much worse wave in um, autumn around the armistice and then a third wave, um, you know, as you can see here in um, 1919. Uh, and um, it was devastating. Devastating also because it hit not only the people who normally or usually die from influenza, elder people, but also um, it was uh, killing disproportionately young people, young adults. Again, the ones who came from the front. Now, why is it called the Spanish flu? There is a certain tendency in history, in people, to always blame others for a problem. <laughs> for some reason, historic reason, Naples is often blamed for all kinds of things. <laughs> Syphilis, gonorrhea, also um, the influenza. Actually, in Spain, they called it the Naples uh, disease. <laughs> and because of the war, there was very heavy control, censorship of news, of the media. There were no social media. So it was fairly easy to, you know, to organize censorship. And any bad news was not allowed to be um, published. So even if it started, the first, um, you know, uh, cases came from, uh, actually from Kansas in, um, in the U.S. Um, that, you know, in March 18, this is where the, uh, the first known case occurred. The, you can't find um, any trace of this in the popular media. But Spain was not a party in, uh, in World War I. So there the media were, okay, um, were fairly free. And so they were publishing about uh, uh, outbreaks in various Spanish cities, and so it became the Spanish flu. Um, and, uh, but each country had a, uh, a different name. But just in Japan, and in Japan, the first victims were sumo wrestlers, you know, the very one. And so it was the sumo disease, the sumo influenza. And, uh, and, and each country in uh, Poland, it was called the Bolshevik uh, uh, influenza, et cetera, et cetera. That in itself is, uh, makes an interesting book and how, um, you know, how diseases are being named. But basically, what's the bad news? You blame the others. Um, now, also, this was at the time when there wasn't um, disease surveillance. There was not something like here, Public Health England. Um, there was not even an understanding what the etiology, what the causes of uh, influenza. It was thought to be 
Pfeiffer's bacillus, which is a bacteria and which we know is not the cause of influenza, which is a viral disease. Um, and um, so it was not so easy to come up with um, a definition or to know exactly what um, the, um, you know, what the disease, how to define it. And here you can see that one thing that we know, and that is that it's spread all over the world. And you can see here the first wave in blue, then the second wave, and then, uh, you know, we had an, um, a third wave. And just remember, there was no commercial air travel in these days. So in no time, a virus spread all over the world where the fastest mode of transport was the train. But the um, movements of troops and also the demobilization afterwards helped. And mass gatherings and uh, celebrations of the armistice and uh, so on and religious festivals and just name it, um, all that contributed. But I still find it remarkable how, um, how fast a virus could spread all over the world just by air, because people have to breathe. Um, in the absence of what the kind of travel that we have now. Um, and so between 50 and 100 million people were killed. You can say, wow, that's a big range. Uh, and the reason for that is that there was no systematic uh, recording of, of deaths in most countries. The definition was not clear um, and so on. But we know for sure that in some parts of the world, and particularly when you're an island was affected by it, you know, up to 20% of the population could die. And one example is the Western Samoa, um, where um, about 22% of the population died. And we ha you have it also not only in the, in the South Pacific, but you can see here the, um, the enormous number of people who died all over. UK, 250,000. Um, now, that was the immediate impact. Um, massive deaths. Um, hospitals couldn't cope. Cemeteries couldn't cope. Um, and it destabilized society, but in a very acute way. Once it was over, kind of life went back to normal, kind of, but not really. Um, because the Spanish flu had long-term impacts, as most uh, epidemics. Um, the economic cost was huge, but on the positive side, it really woke up governments that, okay, we've got to do something. It's a, we have a responsibility, you know, for health. And, and that's kind of where the um, many European countries, particularly, that um, public health um, systems were built and were developed. Um, many orphans were left. Um, millions and millions of orphans. And also, interestingly, it really nurtured a, um, a whole culture, a cult of nature living, healthy lifestyles, which was then afterwards captured by Nazi ideology and by communism. So all this made that uh, the Spanish flu had a, an incredible impact on society. The responses were, in these days, were not based on much of scientific evidence. Even if the germ theory had been demonstrated by Pasteur and Koch and so on, um, you know, several decades before in the uh, 19th century, it was not yet uh, commonly uh, accepted. And also, um, it was not so clear how this um, virus, virus didn't, people didn't know it existed, uh, was transmitted. And, but some things made sense, isolation, quarantine. Um, but like this hospital that you can see here, um, you know, actually probably also contributed to the spread of it because you, uh, there, it's a mixture of people who actually have it and others not. And, um, and something that also appeared, and this is for, um, uh, an image from Japan, where today uh, in Japan and also in some other uh, Asian countries, when someone has a cold or so, 
people walk around with a face mask. That started in these days. So that's interesting that, that the, the origin of it is not to protect yourself, but it's in, in Japan today is you want to protect others. Um, whether that's effective is debatable, depends on what it is. So there was a, um, a, a massive uh, but very uncoordinated um, approach and um, it led to, um, as I said, the birth of a um, lot of modern public health systems. should also say that most people, uh, actually we know today, died from, um, from complications, from pneumonia, from bacterial pneumonia. And the big difference with today is that um, there were no antibiotics then. Today we can treat most of them. Um, so, and why was there a, um, this Spanish flu? Why was this so lethal, so fatal? We know it's a, an influenza virus, and an influenza can be, um, you know, got all kinds of types. It's a virus that mutates all the time, and it's of the so-called H1N1 type, um, but of a completely new type, so that uh, nobody had any um, protection, no, no protective immunity, because the reason that every year we need a different uh, influenza vaccine is that um, the virus has mutated a little bit and uh, so that we need a vaccine with the, the new um, antigenic makeup, the new coat and so on that uh, um, will then induce antibodies against the new strain. And when that's a completely different new strain that we have absolutely no, not been exposed to, that's when you can have this uh, fatal uh, and massive epidemic. Now, epidemics have always been there, um, and uh, we've seen uh, the Asian flu, Hong Kong flu, Russian flu, avian flu, swine flu, and so over the years. Uh, and actually, every year, um, we shouldn't forget that influenza kills tens of thousands of people. That's kind of so-called normal. But the, what may become the biggest epidemic of uh, modern times is still going on, and that's HIV, and I'll come back to that. Already more than 30 million deaths. Now, epidemics, okay, my background is uh, microbiology, infectious diseases, and I've always been fascinated by um, epidemics, by microbes, since I was a child. But it's also um, catching the interest now of people dealing with investment, and with risks. And here, this is from the annual uh, report of the World Economic Forum. They um, publish every year a very interesting report. It's called the Global Risks Report. It's from January this year. And uh, it's based actually on, um, on surveys, what people think and believe there's a risk. And epidemics are always in, in there. So together with social instability, uh, you know, food crisis, water crisis, etc., cyber attacks, and just name it. So they have now, um, they're no longer um, just in the field of public health and of uh, microbiologists. We also know today that the economic impact of um, epidemics can be huge. And um, it's always as close to art as uh, science to estimate what's the global impact uh, in, 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 term, in economic terms but yet, uh, it's fairly uh, precise when, for example, we uh, had SARS. This is the, the first um, major uh, new epidemic of the, this uh, millennium. SARS stands for um, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. It's a, a virus, I'll say a few words about that, that uh, appeared in um, southeastern China and, and, and in Hong Kong was really devastating. There, um, the impact could be measured in a, in a very quite precise way. And so you see we're talking about billions and uh, a huge a new uh, Spanish flu type of epidemic would um, cause trillions of damage. Most actually of the, um, the uh, economic cost is not so much caused by direct impact of the, of the um, epidemic. I mean, that's more medical cost and all that, and lives lost and so on. But it is the fact that epidemics destabilize society. And um, in the case of Hong Kong, for example, um, okay, GDP was hit, 
by about 3%. But, um, you know, um, tourism went down uh, by more than 60%, uh, tourism and all visitors. Um, the, um, you know, food and transport and so on. And uh, this is what's, what's happening. Now, of course, it's not just us human primates who are affected by epidemics. Um, farmers know this very well. Um, and, uh, and I like wine, so wine is also, the, there's been a defining epidemic caused by phylloxera um, also about, well, more than 100 years ago, and uh, which wiped out the, um, the, uh, you know, the vineyards in the, on the old continent in Europe, and fortunately they had planted uh, some vines in California, so we, had, we could re-import that, and, uh, and without that we would not have um, our good wines in the, from Europe. Um, but animals, uh, so epidemics are there all the time, and uh, it's not just limited to, to people. So, and their economic impact uh, can be enormous. And um, it's one of the reasons, for example, that uh, you know, antibiotics are so widespread used in uh, animal husbandry and um, for economic reasons, um, and um, with sometimes very negative impact in, on people. Now, I mentioned SARS epidemic in Hong Kong. And Hong Kong illustrates what we uh, are going to increasingly have, be confronted with, and that is very high density uh, um, you know, populations, dense populations like in Mong Kok, for those of you who have been in uh, Hong Kong, is the most densely populated um, place on Earth. I can't remember the the number of thousands of people per square kilometer. Um, and that's where, um, you know, the SARS virus, which is a coronavirus, is a, is a, a whole family, a new family that we know, and uh, it probably comes from bats that are um, really living happily with the coronavirus. But when it, you know, the virus um, is then introduced in a very densely population, um, this is ideal and it can spread. Um, but secondly, not only did it hit Hong Kong very well, but someone traveled from Hong Kong to Toronto in Canada and uh, caused then a new wave of epidemics there, killing tens of people um, in intensive care units and so on. And that's a big difference with the time of the Spanish flu. Even if I said, okay, it spread all over the world in no time, um, today, that's a matter of hours and not of days. Travel that used to go by boat, you know, I don't know what would have taken to go from Hong Kong to Toronto uh, in uh, 1918, but that was probably more a matter of, I don't know, a week or so or more than that. You have to cross the Pacific Ocean and then go by a train uh, through the Canadian prairies and so on. So that's a... Um, that's one, that was the first one where we saw, okay, it's no longer a local issue we need to care about. Other example is MERS. It's the, another coronavirus um, infection that comes from camels, and uh, it's spreading in the Middle East. ME is Middle East uh, Respiratory Syndrome. And here a Korean businessman flew from Abu Dhabi to Seoul, capital of Korea, and um, didn't feel well went to uh, an emergency room, in the waiting room, um, you know, was examined, etc., cetera, um, and then does something that is quite common in Korea, is medical shopping, and so went from one hospital to another, and, uh, and that caused the death of about 50 people. And uh, I'm not saying the person is guilty, but that's, you know, through overcrowding in, in, in um, you know, in waiting rooms and in, um, intensive care units. Again, st it's an epidemic that continues in the Middle East, the Gulf states, but then it could hit Korea. And then finally, um, these are all transmitted through, um, you know, through air, through, through breathing, basically. Um, but then something happened that was also unexpected. A few years ago in, um, in Brazil, there was a, uh, an epidemic caused by Zika virus. Now, Zika is the name of a forest in Uganda, near Entebbe. Uh, 
It's actually owned by the Medical Research Council. Um, and um, because in the 40s, in 1947, a virus was isolated from monkeys in, um, in the Zika forest by the Uganda Virus Research Institute uh, while they were uh, looking for, uh, you know, the ecology for the, the spread of yellow fever vaccine. And by accident, they found this virus. And it was a virus without a disease, and, uh, you know, as there are so many viruses. And it took then um, about uh, 70 years uh, before um, it was clear that this was also um, a, a major risk to health. And it caused a huge epidemic, first in uh, the uh, Pacific Islands, but then in, particularly in Brazil. And um, the biggest problem was, okay, not so much for adults, because it gives you dengue fever-like syndromes, in other words, a bad influenza plus uh, skin rash and, 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 and joint uh, aches and so on. But if you're pregnant, the, um, the baby is born from mothers who are infected with um, Zika virus, particularly during the first trimester, are born with neurological complications and microcephaly, so small brains, small heads. Just like we've seen, we, we had here uh, with rubella, German measles before there was a vaccine. Today we don't know this anymore thanks to, to vaccines. There's no vaccine against uh, uh, Zika. The big difference with the previous epidemics is that this is transmitted by a mosquito. By a mosquito called Aedes aegypti that is also transmitting yellow fever, dengue, chikungunya, and because of climate change and warming, it's spreading, uh, you know, it's... Um, you know, um, the, its field around the world. Um, now, Ebola, because Ebola is um, something that I spent some time on, but also um, when you think of the two defining epidemics of our time, it's not influenza, which has killed so many people and still kills, but in, in the um, imagination, in the media, it is Ebola and it's AIDS. These are the two defining epidemics. And when I was uh, much younger, in 1976, um, my life changed when I was tra in training in uh, microbiology uh, in, the, in the lab in Antwerp. Uh, we received a, um, a blue thermos from uh, Kinshasa, uh, which was the capital of what was then called Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of Congo. And it contained two glass files. There was no plastic. It was all in glass and uh, with a little note and, uh, asking, is this yellow fever? And it was blood from a, uh, a Catholic missionary, a nun, who had died with what they thought was maybe yellow fever. And um, the, um, we did the usual things to isolate viruses. In these days, it was more like cooking. It's like very artisanal. You inject mice, you uh, put it on cells and so on, and then you wait, and then you look at on an electron microscope. And what did we see under the electron microscope was, um, was this, this image. Uh, and um, we had never seen this. So we had to go to the library. This for the younger people. There was no, um, you know, no, we couldn't Google or whatever to go to a library. And then you had to, if you know what that is, you know, and then uh, <laughs> and go and then consult an atlas, you know, with images and photos of viruses. And we were lucky that we had all that in the institute I was working in, the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp. And we saw that this looked exactly like Marburg virus. Now, Marburg is a city in Germany where they, are, they have vaccine um, manufacturing plants. And we're making a polio vaccine. And um, a few years before, uh, about a um, total of, um, I think it was like 30 people, uh, in Marburg and in uh, Yugoslavia, the then Yugoslavia, had died with Marburg virus infection while they were manipulating um, monkey kidney cells that uh, had been infected with Marburg virus coming from Central Africa. So we thought it was that. And then there was a moment of panic and we got a, a telegram from the World Health Organization saying we should stop all uh, research, all investigations with these viruses because we did not have the containment. I mean, um, 
And we sent it here in London to um, Porton Down, and there, were, there was a military lab um, with uh, maximum security, what we call now um, BSL-4 level. And uh, there were only four labs in the world these days. Three were military, one in the Soviet Union, one in Fort Detrick to the US, and one here, Porton Down. And then one civil one that's at the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. And it's in Atlanta, at the Centers for Disease Control, that uh, they could demonstrate this was not Marburg, but it was a new virus. So, so they really confirmed this was new. So that was exciting, but I was particularly curious to know what is this virus doing to people, how is it spreading, um, you know, and so on. And, um, and by the way, the name Ebola is, um, because viruses need a name, um, is the name of a river that is flowing not too far from what was the epicenter of um, the first known Ebola outbreak uh, in northern uh, Congo, uh, northern sea. And it all started uh, uh, around a mission hospital, you can see here, and the canary in the mine, in a sense, were five missionaries, Belgian missionaries, who died with this. They were caring for patients, the, 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 the women and the and this, uh, uh, the priest who had um, been caring for the death. And, um, and I'm mentioning that because it's such a remote area that it may not have been, without them, we may never have known. Um, and uh, the, we arrived there. I, I had um, never been to Africa and had zero experience in, um, you know, investigating epidemics, so why on earth did I go there? I was, I was excited because this, I saw this as a great opportunity and there were not that many people who were eager to go and there was not uh, a... Uh, um, yeah, there was, it's, there's, it's not like today where we have a core, like it's this country, we have a rapid support team, we had volunteers during the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. So I could go and... Uh, um, this is the kind of protection that we had. It was very primitive, a paper gown, um, motorbike goggles and uh, latex gloves, and that's it. And yet we, um, we couldn't really care for patients. We tried to do that, but was we wanted to, uh, you know, to do a few things. One, in an epidemic, the most important type of information that you need is to know what's the cause of the epidemic, and how is that <clears throat> pathogen, virus, microbe, whatever, transmitted? Is it through water, food, insects, um, sex, um, blood, um, air, um, direct contact? I mean, the usual ways that viruses um, are transmitted. And that, um, that was our number one priority because otherwise you don't know what you have to do. Um, and that was the situation in the Spanish flu 100 years ago. People didn't really understand it. Um, secondly, um, in science, you always need confirmation. We had one isolate, and uh, so we needed um, more samples from other patients to, um, to confirm that this was indeed, the, the, that virus was associated with this uh, disease. We also, of course, needed to take care of patients as much as we could, but there was not much we could do, frankly. Um, and uh, lastly, it was, of course, was so-called stop the epidemic. That was our, these were our terms of reference, to use that bureaucratic term. Um, and uh, it was also, um, you try to define an epidemic in terms of three questions. Time, place, and person. Time, how is it evolving over, you know, what's the epidemic curve? For example, we go to a picnic, particularly with this kind of weather, and... Uh, um, you know, the cream is, uh, um, is contaminated with staphylococcus. By, um, by midnight, everybody's on the loo. And it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very acute type of epidemic. Uh, or norovirus and so on. Um, case of HIV, slow spread because it's sex and all that. And, uh, and here, this is what we saw. And we arrived, actually, to be totally transparent, around here. So when the epidemic curve was going down. In other words, the epidemic was already going out, which is the best time to come in an epidemic when, as an epidemiologist, because people may think that it's thanks to your work. Um, <laughs> but uh, 
But then ideally you want to come here. So that means, because then you can prevent that it goes up right, to these peaks. But that was um, not the case because very remote area and so on. And uh, <clears throat> so that was important to know. We wonder, okay, why did it go down here? And what happened around this time, um, about uh, a week before, is that the hospital in this remote area had been abandoned by patients. People had said, you know, people had dying those when they said there's something wrong with that hospital. And that was also confirmed in other ways. One is that 11 out of 17 hospital staff had died. Two, that the closer you would live to the hospital, the more likely that you had Ebola. And um, we also found that there was an excess of pregnant women and of women who had just delivered. And it turned out that all of them had gone to the hospital, to the antenatal care unit or that delivered there. And um, so all this put together without any computers or whatever um, and some very primitive statistics um, led us to um, identifying the mode of transmission. Because what was clear is that you needed very close contact with a patient with Ebola. And that was, in a sense, good news. Um, not so much for healthcare workers or family members, um, but that meant that the risk of um, major spread was far more limited. And, um, but in addition to caring for a patient and having close contact, there was something else that uh, we found is that attending a funeral was very risky. And the reason is that um, at a funeral, um, in the local culture, people really take their time to say farewell to their loved ones. It's actually a moving ceremony, a ritual, and um, something that in our cultures we've forgotten. We just don't want to deal with death, and it's done left to professionals to clean the body and so on. There it's done by the family. Now, that's very moving, but it's very risky, because someone who dies with Ebola is covered with, often with blood, not always, but, but certainly vomitus, uh, diarrhea, so in other words, full of virus. And that is a very risky moment also. The one thing that we did not um, find uh, in these days was that it's also sexual transmission. So that came later, that came out of the work in, uh, um, in West Africa years later. Now, since 76, there have been many outbreaks, all in Central Africa. You know, of, uh, in red you have Ebola, and in uh, blue, uh, Marburg, to related viruses. So around uh, Congo, and uh, Gabon, and uh, Uganda, and so on. And, um, and that was the, the, the dogma was, this is a Central African thing, because the virus reservoir is most probably, we still don't know for sure, is a fruit-eating bat. And, uh, by the way, bats are very special animals from a biological perspective, and they hardly ever develop cancer. Um, they can harbor all kinds of viruses that kill in no time other animals. So their immune system and their system for repairing their uh, DNA, and that, so it's, it's our DNA is constantly uh, you know, being degraded and so on, uh, is very remarkable. I don't know much about bat biology, but... Um, but I've read a lot about it, and it's absolutely fascinating. We should study bats much more. Um, but then everything changed in 2014, when um, there were the first reports, and it was in March uh, 2014, that there was Ebola virus infection in uh, West Africa. And, um, and I was uh, in three countries, in addition, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea. And it started in, we know today, around Christmas, in 2013, in a town called Kekedu, in a, a border town in Guinea, Conakry. Um, but the borders are very artificial. They come from colonial times, and but people are, you know, crossing the border all the time. They have um, relatives on the other side of the border. They, they marry with someone, etc. They trade and so on. And the roads are quite good, which is a big difference from Congo. And um, it took about three months to uh, know that this was Ebola. So first case on the 23rd of December, we know today, 
Um, and laboratory conf uh, confirmation was um, on the 21st of March. So a lot of precious time was wasted. Now, Liberia and Sierra Leone just came out of very brutal civil war and leading to not only a collapse of um, society in general, but also um, professionals uh, left the country, infrastructure not there, and so on, so labs. Guinea, decades of corrupt dictatorship. Similar problem, similar results. Um, and also, you can only find what you're looking for. Nobody was looking for Ebola in West Africa, um, but for other things. So it was actually an Institut Pasteur in, um, you know, in, uh, in Dakar, in, in, in Senegal, that they uh, could prove that this was Ebola. And then there was some, uh, you know, a bit of support and all that, but not really much. And uh, you can see how um, the cases started to build up um, in May, June. And uh, I remember in the early July that um, I was uh, interviewed by uh, Christian Anampour of CNN. And I said, this is uh, uh, really, uh, this is completely different from what we've seen before. Um, Three countries involved, capital cities, there were only, quote-unquote, 600 cases, but said this is different, this requires a state of emergency and special measures, because we've never been confronted with it. And after that interview, I told myself, I'm a Flemish guy, I'm just not supposed to create panic, so yeah, usually we kind of try to, you know, just stick to the facts, uh, and I wonder, maybe I exaggerated, but unfortunately, this is what... Uh, was required in order to stop this epidemic. And it's only in August, so eight months, five months after the, uh, the diagnosis that the World Health Organization declared that this was a public health um, crisis. Uh, and that is a, um, there's a specific term uh, that then triggers um, international um, support and all that. And that was a clear failure of global governance um, that, um, you know, uh, will have dramatic uh, consequences. And the first question that we thought was, uh, oh, maybe it's Ebola, but maybe this is a different strain. Because Ebola has different uh, types of Ebola. And some are more uh, lethal than others. And maybe we thought, okay, this uh, one that we didn't know that popped up. But today, unlike in uh, 76, we can know in a few hours, at most a day, whether a virus is identical or not from another one that we know. And so you can do, um, you know, through gene sequencing, um, we, could, we, we knew very rapidly on that this was a classic so-called Zaire strain. So it was not a new virus. And, um, and this is from an editorial in Science Magazine, and so I said, this is really, it's about society and populations. It was a perfect storm. It was a perfect storm a virus that was unknown, people had no experience with it, but entering countries that were not prepared for any shock. Um, Liberia, for example, had 51 registered physicians, um, you know, um, for a population of about 5 million. Um, Sierra Leone, a few more. Guinea, much more. No infrastructure. Um, also, a total distrust of what authorities would say. When you come out of civil war and the government says we have an epidemic, people say, oh, maybe because we were in the opposition and we were, you know, and they want to do, the, they have an agenda and so on. Also, um, norms and uh, beliefs about transmission of disease were also very different. Um, so, and then the, the great delay in action. Um, in epidemics, what's crucial is act early. And the reason is because, by definition, people are always infected by somebody else. So if you can prevent an, um, the development of an epidemic very early on, you're not only preventing the next case, but also the, the several uh, generations. And that's what, uh, um, what did not happen. Um, and it led to major um, social unrest, um, because life came to a standstill. Okay, hospitals were closed, women who had to deliver, nowhere to go, you break your, you know, your leg, uh, 
have an accident, uh, all, you know, life goes on. No care. But also schools are closed, university was closed, commerce came to a halt. Some point of its harvest season, the farmers couldn't sell their co commerce. And to make things worse, um, airlines stopped flying into uh, these countries. And so um, that was also a major um, disaster. And, um, you know, the countries are living, the main economy is driven by mines mining and the price of commodities was going down, etc. So it was really a, a major social issue, um, an economic issue, and uh, some people were even killed during um, these uh, riots and uh, also uh, journalists and nurses who were going to come to work um, were killed. Sorry. Now, at the end of the day, the epidemic stopped. 11,000 people were killed. Um, thanks to Heroic efforts from people on the ground, local people, but also major um, support from elsewhere. And the UK was really at the forefront. We concentrated on Sierra Leone for historic reasons. Um, Americans on Liberia and the French on Guinea. That's uh, still part of uh, history today. And um, we had uh, lots of volunteers coming through Public Health England to uh, nurses and um, doctors and so on. And uh, in, in the end of August, early September, I sent a note to uh, an email to all staff at the London School of Hygiene, Tropical Medicine, and I said, this is a crisis going on, a humanitarian crisis, public health crisis. It's our duty to support, and I encourage everybody to volunteer. And we had in 48 hours more than 400 volunteers. Out we were then about 1,500 people, and I, it was my proudest moment because I know that people are here for a reason. Um, not everybody could go, of course, but it was people from the IT department, from communications, from, of course, from the labs, and so on. And when you think of it, um, epidemics, what do you need? I mean, it's the medical care, sure, but it's coordination, it's logistics, it's communication. That's why also the armed forces were so important to, uh, to, to contribute and to come in. And that was the case in Sierra Leone with the UK armed forces and in uh, Liberia, the Americans. Now, a silver lining on all this was that for the first time ever in such a dramatic outbreak, there was actually uh, some research was done. Social science research with mathematical modeling and so on, but also, um, you know, um, therapeutic and vaccine-related research. So, so we could evaluate are some of the experimental therapies, do they work, do they protect? And um, the answer was, in general, either no or we don't know because the number, the sample size was too short, too small. But the major, um, I think, advance was uh, particularly on the vaccine field. Thanks to actually um, funding from um, anti-bioterrorism um, funding, from particularly coming yeah, from the military in the US and also from... Uh, in Canada from the Public Health Service, some experimental vaccines um, existed. GSK had one, um, Johnson & Johnson, Johnson, and uh, Merck. And the Merck vaccine um, was evaluated in um, Guinea in so-called ring vaccination, where the vaccine was given to contacts of someone with Ebola, and then it was a, a trial design. Our school developed a trial design, and it showed it demonstrated that it was really highly, highly effective to uh, stop the spread of, um, of Ebola. And in, um, in Sierra Leone, our school continues to work on um, a, another vaccine that's particularly aiming at protecting healthcare workers and the general population, because imagine if you can protect a healthcare worker, you don't need to have this incredibly cumbersome, um, you know, protective clothing and so on, and... Uh, uh, you wouldn't have this uh, absolute um, disaster in healthcare workers. More than 500 were killed during the, world, uh, the West Africa outbreak. 500 healthcare workers in countries that already have a shortage. So the lessons were that a perfect storm can generate major epidemics. Even in the past, it was smaller. Two, that you have to act early. Public trust is absolutely key. Um, you know, it's not a bunch of experts that's going to 
you know, solve the problem if the public is not, you know, doesn't have confidence. We saw new clinical features, for example, um, sexual transmission and all that. There was a real failure of global governance, but R&D was possible. Now, today, as we speak, there is an outbreak of Ebola going on, in, again, in DRC. And um, I would say there's good news. Uh, one being a swift response by the Congolese. It's one of the most disorganized countries in the world, I think. I worked there. Um, and, uh, but yet, they've got experience. They can make diagnosis in Kinshasa, and they act immediately, led by the Minister of Health himself. And the World Health Organization and MSF, Doctors Without Borders, were there, very proactive. The advantage was that it's in a very remote area, hard to reach. When you see, that makes it tough to get there, but also it makes it tough to get out. Uh, you can only get in with bicycles or motorbikes or helicopters. Even a four-wheel drive doesn't get there. So, and that means that it's been contained and vaccines have been used for the first time. So I'm quite optimistic that uh, we will see the uh, break uh, coming to an end soon. Um, now, it's, when you look at most epidemics, in today's world, and we know that from the deployment of the rapid support team of the UK, um, that are actually linked to humanitarian crisis. Yemen, where there's a, yeah, an absolutely bloody civil war going on, or, and, and not only civil war, but with lots of international players, there have been the largest uh, cholera epidemic um, ever. More than a million cases. South Sudan, the same. Um, when the Rohingya were massively um, displaced and killed um, in Burma um, and went to uh, Bangladesh, there was big outbreaks of um, diphtheria um, and other uh, vaccine-preventable diseases, indicating that they had not been protected. So we can expect more and more because of the increase in, um, in, in, in um, humanitarian crisis. Now, the final epidemic I'm going to talk about before also trying to answer the question, are we ready, is um, a new situation. And that is when an epidemic becomes endemic. Epidemic is when you see a continuing increase in cases. Endemic is that when there, is, there are new cases and it stays more or less at the same level. It's simmering. And that's the case for HIV. Um, HIV came out of the blue in, and was the first cases were diagnosed in 1981. Six gay men in, in uh, California, and it was thought to be a gay disease, which I never understood why a virus would care about the sexual orientation of a human host. Uh, because what's the purpose in life of a virus? It's finding a host so it can survive. And, and the sex between humans is, yeah, that's the way to do it in this case. Um, but so all of these six or eight initial cases, cumulatively, 70 million people now, over 70 million people have become infected, all connected with each other, because only sex uh, can transmit it, or contact with blood, uh, blood transfusion, sharing of needles, or because your mother had it when you were born. Um, and that gives a new idea of blood relatives. So every, and also of what's going on in the world. More than 70 million people connected underground. And um, it really uh, got out of control, particularly in some um, uh, African countries. But it was a massive response. It really, around millennium, gave rise to what we call today global health, a combination of uh, activism of people in, in our uh, countries, or in, in the gay community, but also, like in South Africa, here, see, there were massive uh, movements of people living with HIV. South Africa, which has now six million people living with HIV. And, um, you know, and because with, in, in HIV, the, the time between infection and that you become ill can, become, can be as long as 10 years. So there's time to, yeah, to agitate. Um, so we had um, massive mobilization, we came on the um, the world's attention with the, uh, through the UN and so on, and I was then uh, head of uh, UNAIDS. The UN even created a body to, to coordinate the fight against uh, uh, HIV. And thanks to these massive efforts and also a scientific breakthrough, because in 1996, 
it was shown that you can treat HIV if you combine three different drugs. And why do you need three different drugs? Because like influenza, it's a virus that mutates all the time. And so the risk that it becomes resistant if you give just one drug is enormous. But with three, statistically, is the risk is much, much lower. And, uh, and that was a um, change completely, the game in high-income countries. In the NHS, you know, in September, these drugs were available. It was announced in July, so in three months' time, and people survived. It was no longer a death sentence. It changed how we looked at this epidemic. However, the price was far too high. It was about, in US dollar terms, $14,000 per person per year. Um, and that was out of um, reach for most people in the world, where there isn't an insurance system or where they had to pay it out of pocket. And most of the patients were actually in, living in low- and middle-income countries. Um, and here you see that um, how the price of uh, these drugs of uh, one-year treatment uh, in Uganda dropped from $12,000 to what it is now, about 300 in other words, a dollar a day. And that's uh, something that I became absolutely um, obsessed with, that to lower that price, but also at the same time making sure that innovation continues because we need new drugs because development uh, resistance is developed. And so over the years, um, the number of people on therapy uh, went up, and we are now well uh, above 20 million. And uh, these 20 million people would have been dead without these, um, these drugs. Hence the um, headlines, the end of AIDS, uh, and the UN even said that by 2030 the epidemic will be out. Don't believe that. That's not going to happen. There, is, there are major achievements, but no successes. You see a decline of 50% in mortality, new infection going down, but still 2 million new infections per year in the world. 2 million, um, including here in London, although it's also gone down. So we, we are got in, in, a, in, a, in a situation where um, it's no longer that epidemic, but we see every day the same level of infections. Now, what do all these uh, epidemics have in common? Ebola, influenza, um, you know, HIV, and that is that they're so-called zoonosis. A zoonosis is a, an infection that affects us, but it comes originally from other animals. And HIV comes from chimpanzees originally. Uh, you see bats um, that are, you know, are the reservoir for uh, several, quite a few viruses, coronaviruses and probably Ebola. Influenza, there's a whole panoply of uh, uh, animals from... Um, you know, um, particularly poultry, uh, that uh, where the virus is yeah, living in and, and can mutate, re recombine, and then um, when it jumps to uh, people, that's when you get this epidemic. So these are zoonoses. And that's why, um, even if we are being quite successful in bringing down infections, infectious diseases in, in, in general, people... In, in our countries, die from cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, and so on, and cancer, not from infections, although it's sometimes pneumonia that is the final uh, hit, you know, in old age particularly. But it is a combination of urbanization, so high-density populations, enormous mobility, um, you know, um, climate change that uh, increases the spread of uh, uh, several insects, mosquitoes that transmit diseases, infections, conflict, deforestation, food demand, population growth, all that makes that we will be, um, be exposed to more and more uh, of these emerging infections. The risk is getting bigger. And then there is one man-made type of epidemic that we are confronted with and uh, uh, where, we we'll say, the UK, particularly led by Dame Sally Davis, the chief medical officer, and uh, Lord O'Neill, um, you know, they've drawn the world's attention that there is a real threat of antimicrobial resistance because of overuse and misuse and abuse of antibiotics, which would mean if, it, if this materializes that we are confronted with untreatable infections. Now, what about the future? Okay, to the, going towards the end. Um, when I was in my final year in medical school, I went with some, something that we call today career counseling, but I don't think the term existed then. And it's 
and I wanted to work on infectious diseases and infections. And my professor said, no future in infectious diseases. <laughs> Don't we have antibiotics? Don't we have um, vaccines? Don't we have sanitation? And it was also thought in these days that you could not treat in, uh, viral infections because in order to kill the virus, you would have to kill the, 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 the cell, in other words, the host. Today, we know that that's wrong. Um, and yet, I went for it. But uh, um, after the Ebola outbreak in um, West Africa in 2014, um, there was a, um, an outbreak of panels to review what went wrong. And I co-chaired one with uh, Harvard University, and, uh, and we all came to the same conclusions. And the conclusions was that the first thing that's most important, one, that there will be more epidemics, the, the risk in the world is, is increasing, but that the, um, the most important thing is the local um, capacity for early detection and early response. It's not the global response that we see in the newspapers and all that. And, uh, but that's not there, so we have to invest in that. Um, that WHO, the World Health Organization, was not fit for purpose and needed to become far more child responsive and so on. Um, that we need to engage with people on the ground. I mean, all this is not rocket science, but that's the way. There was also uh, really bad behavior by scientists, by public health uh, organizations, not sharing samples, not sharing data in the midst of an epidemic which is vital to have very rapid uh, and uh, real-time information. And finally, that we need a system for developing therapies and uh, vaccines where there's no market incentive. No pharmaceutical company is going to make big money with a vaccine against Ebola or whatever. There's, you know, there's no market. And yet, in this case, certainly, I mean, J&J, Merck, and, and, and uh, JSK all invested uh, in this, with, uh, knowing very well that they're not going to make uh, much profit out of it, or no profit at all, I would say. So, what has happened since then? Have we made progress? The answer is yes. One, I think, very important is that um, this kind of epidemic, uh, what's now called global health security, new term, um, now is now on uh, the top agendas of the G7, G20, World Economic Forum, and so on. So, I think that's important because also that may lead to money. Um, we have also, uh, the UK has established a what's called UK Public Health Rapid Support Team that um, uh, is a hybrid between Public Health England, which is part of the Department of Health and Social Care, and the London School of Hygiene, Tropical Medicine, academic institution, so that we can be deployed rapidly. It's about 12 people at the moment there in, uh, in Congo, but they... Uh, and one of the concerns that we, or that some people had, was what are they going to do in between two epidemics? The government was concerned that they would be people paying people for doing nothing. There was a, but the reality is that they've not been um, without two weeks of, of an epidemic, and that actually burnout is now the biggest issue, because people have to go from here to there. So we're now expanding that to... Uh, a network of volunteers, and they've been uh, in, in many countries uh, in just in one year. Also, on the R&D front, good progress. Um, we have um, the so-called Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, CEPI, which brings together big pharma, um, governments, NGOs, small pharma, academ academia, and uh, to invest in vaccines where there's no market incentive. And here are the priorities. And we put that together in a, in a good year, which is also a record. Now, another issue that we have, we have vaccines, we have science, and then, paradoxically, we have also a growing, I could say even epidemic in some country, of skepticism towards science, vaccines, um, and, um, you know, part of fake news, uh, which led to a collapse in uh, vaccine coverage in quite a few countries. Here we had the Wakefield, episodes, that we're over that, but there are others. And um, so the final uh, question is, what is there going to be the next big one? If you give a talk like this in California, everybody knows the big, then the big one is big earthquake, which will wipe out Silicon Valley, among other things. But it will happen, we don't know when. And the same is true for a big um, 
epidemic of a respiratory virus, influenza, or another one that mutates all the time. And the risk is enormous. You know, we were 1.9 billion people in uh, 1918. We are 7.6 today, huge mobility, but we have epidemics, uh, antibiotics, and we, have, we are much better organized now. So I think that uh, the answer to the question is yes and no. We, the risk is increased, but I think we are definitely better prepared. But the key is to invest in countries. And this is a final slide. Like, um, um, this is now four years ago, yeah, when for, to, for my 65th birthday, uh, my wife Heidi and I, we went to uh, where the first epidemic had happened in Yambuku. I wanted to see what was happening in the meantime and so on. And after that first outbreak, there was a meeting hosted by the World Health Organization and where many promises were made. We will never let this happen again. It's like after every war. Huh? We will strengthen the systems. We will uh, build capacity. I mean, you can just make a whole list. And when we came there, it was really depressing. The hospital was in worse state than before. Uh, this man you can see there, Sukato, he's a survivor of Ebola from 76. He runs the lab. The only decent equipment is this, lab, is this microscope. This is the centrifuge. The people had no money, so they leave their bicycle to have uh, drugs and so on. So the lesson is that that's something that we should not, not let happen. And um, this is why it's important that we have this international solidarity to use that old-fashioned world because in today's world, an epidemic, an outbreak 5,000 miles from here can affect us tomorrow. So thank you very much. If you want to know more, this is us. <laughs> <laughs>